I've been around for a long time with the Bee College, with I'm a real Jamie Ellis disciple. And so I've been real involved with Bee College over the years. And I've also, like uh, we were talking, with Favica was the international core that I've been working with since around 05. And I started doing training. They sent me down. It was a volunteer corp that um, Governor Graham had started years ago. And it ran for about 30 years until the governor this past year killed it and got rid of it. But it was a volunteer corps for the Caribbean. And anybody, the Caribbean always looks at us as our, their big brother. Anything that they need information on, they would come to Florida for and we would send down volunteers. So I became part of the core. There was a, a long line before me of, of volunteers and, and apiary for training in the Caribbean. So I would go down and begin basically teach beginner training in Barbados. And a couple months later, they may send me down to St. Vincent because they had an American fall brood breakout. And I had to go down and show them, teach them what it was about and burn hives, um, any, any needs that they would need. So I've gone down to, I think, close to around 14 different countries now through the Caribbean over the years and helped them with different problems and, and aid that they may need. And with that came with the Bee College then. Uh, I talked to Jamie Ellis about it. And we were able to start the Caribbean Bee College here four or five years ago. So we've been able to start get that program going because for the need for education throughout the Caribbean islands. Do we find it? There you are. The Haitian one? That, that's it. That's the one? That's it. You're good. And so I, I've been going down, and one of the other projects that I've been working on has been Haiti. Has anybody ever been down to Haiti at all? Couple, couple people, you know how rough it is. I mean, it's just another another world in itself um, going down there. And beekeeping is really tough in, throughout the Caribbean in general. I mean, it's a whole different makeup than we're used to. It's a lot more tropic. Um, the Caribbean isn't as glorious and glamorous as a lot of people think they are with the resorts. It's pretty much third world across the board in any of the islands that you go to. I'm sure a lot of people have gone down through. And it gets harder and harder the farther north in the chain you get because you're getting into more lime, lime rock and you're not going to have the vegetation you are. And that's what's the problem with Haiti is, is that they basically don't have a lot of vegetation left with all the deforestation over the years. And the Bahamas are real hard to keep bees also because there's just not quite enough vegetation for them. Um, the line is somewhere around Antigua and the uh, British Virgin Islands, some of their St. Martins. That's kind of just south of that is where the line draws. And you can pretty much get low from Antigua south. You start getting a little bit more vegetation. It gets a little bit easier to keep bees. And I like doing beekeeping because for sustainable development projects, and that's what I've been working on with the, the Master Bee Program has been rural development throughout the Caribbean. Um, anybody ever seen? Coconut. Bunch of holes in it. This is this is a this is a queen cage. This this is what they keep. This is how you trap queens and you move queens around in the Caribbean. You use a coconut. So everything's ingenious. It's really kind of neat to see. So it's always that mother of invention that they're doing down there. How, they just let them out. They just drop it in the cage and let them out. Or they put a little blow some smoke in 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 the, one of the other little holes and chase her out the hole. The, they, they, it actually opens up. It's cracked in half here, and they've stitched it back together again. So it's just a real quick little stitch. Um, equipment in, throughout the Caribbean is real rare. I mean, it's real expensive to get. And we've tried to implement it in a lot of the countries, even to getting around the taxes, but then they get it at the port, and then they charge them an, an excess tax for storage. So it's always an issue going out throughout the Caribbean. Um, but I'm here to talk about Haiti a little bit. Haiti's really improved in the last, since the earthquake. Population, 10 million, they're not quite sure. Everything is up in the air. Could be 12, could be 14 million. They really don't know. But Port-au-Prince is around 3.3 to, to around 4 million people in the city alone. Um, when I started going down, this is a real big number. Since the earthquake, that number is, is $4 more. It was a dollar and a half when I was started. It was about 90 cents a, a, a day down when I started down there, and it's up there on 450 a day. Unemployment is still around, uh, is around 80%. That's dropped a little bit, it was around 90. It still is basically that agro economy. It's 200 years old. 
they first formed their independence in, in 1804. They, they got their independence from France. So it's been a, an amazing struggle through the years. And they've just had problems with leadership all over the years. Typical third world country. Um, the UN has been down through there and they've had a lot of problems with the UN. It's, it's a bizarre group. It's like Nepal and Uruguay. It's just these, the, the communications between them. They were actually blamed for this big cholera outbreak a couple of years ago. Has been the is the UN workers, and the, basically the UN do, does is they've got a couple major slum areas or cities in Port-au-Prince, and they kind of patrol them and keep the people at bay and don't let them get out of control because they know that they're so it's so bad. Uh, they're basically gang oriented. They've actually asked me to go down here next month, the next month or two, to work in this city, and it's basically just gang control. It's about a fifty thousand people city, but it's just you don't you have to pay to get in and out of them because they're just so, so bad. Um, they had this, the, the major storms. I mean, the earthquakes and it was, was kind of the, 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 the biggest you know, drop <laughs> to the population there. And it really and it happened in Port-au-Prince itself. Uh, the country the, where I've been working is down in here in the mountain areas. This has been really uh, very remote. I mean, this is all this mountain range down here. We just had a project going on down on this island here. We're starting to do some beekeeping down there. Uh, the North has been getting most of the attention over the years here, Cape Haitian. There's a, this is Dominican Republic in this area is, is really good beekeeping operations, but there's no communications back and forth between the two. It's really, really pretty sad. State of beekeeping, we really don't know what, what's going on there, just like anything else in Haiti, we just don't know. Uh, we estimate somewhere around 30,000 colonies. Beekeepers, we really don't know. In that northern area there, they do get Langstroth equipment. That's just with all the USA that's been going in there over the years. In the southwest where I've been working, it's basically all bee gum log stuff. Production is all over the place. I mean, you can get about 15 pounds from the Langstroth equipment because it's not used properly, like we know how we use it. And the logs is harvested about once every year, year and a half. They'll get about five pounds out of a log. Um, I like to photograph bees wherever I go, and I usually bring back wings and leg samples back and send them off to the lab for testing. Um, David Dijon is the big geneticist in Brazil, so I send him the legs, and they're actually trying to work with programs to find out where the origin of bees came from, is you can actually send in the hairs the way they line up on the rear legs and the wing veins, you can actually start telling where they came from originally in Europe. So a lot of these bees we think are some of the original bees coming back, and that's been always been, been one of my key points is I believe that the Spanish actually brought a lot of these bees in. And you see a lot of these black bees down through the islands. There's a lot of that feral stock, that, like the Iberian bees. Everybody familiar with Apis mellifera iberica? We're, our, our bees are European bees or the or langustica, but the, Euro, the bees from the Spanish peninsula there in Portugal, that's all the black bees, are our Iberica. Um, it's, I always, um, my take is that I think Span the, uh, Columbus brought the original bees into Hispaniola, which is Haiti and Dominican Republic on his third voyage. He really beefed up Santa Domingo on his third voyage in 1498. He brought a lot of livestock on and then he went down, kept going to, Port to Trinidad, Tobago to, to discover that area. But he really beefed up that area of livestock and I think that's when they brought some of these original bees in. And a lot of the beekeepers that you see are still working in that same kind of traditions. They really don't know what's going on in beekeeping. Port-au-Prince. This has all been cleaned up. This was right before the earthquake and this is just a normal street scenes. I mean, it's just the, the, the poverty is just overwhelming. Um, I've been working, like I say, down in the southwest in the, in the mountain regions. And this was my group. It was about four hours away from Port-au-Prince. This was all my beekeepers showed up in a truck. And then from there, we had to go about a mount, an hour and a half up the mountain, and we negotiated with a bunch of guys with mopeds, and they ran everybody up to the mountainsides. Um, one of the canals that reads out to the ocean, just the pollution, everything is just overstressed and overworked. The, the entire place is just majorly, uh, has major problems. I don't know. That was a sheep. That was a sheep. Um, they did, basically, they, they, they still use um, wood for all their cooking, so they have deforested the island. 
But the French distorted a lot of it and took a lot of it away first. So you've got a lot of this, the soil is just completely down. Now you've got that lime rock under it, the soil's all run off in the ocean, and it screwed up all the reefs. So there's hardly any soil, a little bit of topsoil left even to grow crops. And being a gradual economy, it's really tough. But you do come across these massive trees every once in a while out there. And here was this giant swarm on this branch that was just massive. And you can see by the size of the truck and people how high it is, it is up there. And I, I could not find any bees. I, I go back year after year, and I could not find any bees underneath it. So I know they have mites in Varroa, in Varroa there, but I could never find them underneath this tree. And about the last year I was there, this is actually gone. Somebody actually crawled up this thing, scaled underneath that, and cut it off. Um, honey's a real big commodity like anything else down there. And, we, and my, part of my project is, is to try to get them into something that they can use for the barter system. These are, these are actually all new hives. This is new equipment. Wood is very valuable. And this is up in the north. Um, in the south, you wouldn't find anything like this. Um, they can't even build coffins down there. They, they literally would big, dig coffins up and, and reuse the wood. So they started making them out of pressed wood, out of pressed sawdust and that, and plastic. This is Langstroth. But as you can see, it's, it's Langstroth at, at the, the most primitive. And this is what a lot of the US aid has gone into, is in aiding people down there in this equipment. This was their, the honey house in the background. It's just a woven little, little shack. Those boxes are what, about 20 frames? It's, no, they're, they're, about the, they're a little bit longer than, than ours, but not much. I mean, they, just, they have no clue as to what, how to do it properly. They try to do this. They try to use the same depth frames that we have. They try to use it and they try to mimic it. But they're carving all these things out of little sticks, so the time effort is really hard. And then when you get into when you start getting into the extraction, you start getting into these old bicycle spokes and old drums. So a lot of the, the frames get broken, and then we know what happens after they start breaking the frames. The frames are all busted up. They're all that nice wax on them. They start using it for kindling to start their fires to eat with. And then all of a sudden, the bees are just building off all the comb off the top of the lids. So that becomes a real problem across the board. This is one of my favorite shots. Mother, mother of invention again. They, it's a shoebox. Just taking a shoebox, punch a couple holes in it, and you put that over your face. That's beekeeping. They, they, don't, they don't haven't had the uh, problem with bees. The beetles have been found in Dominican Republic. They have not been found in, in Haiti yet that I know of. It's, it's possible in that northeast, up in this area, but I'm not sure. I know they have Varroa. Because of the old, because of the boxes? The vo boxes and just the, you know, it, it is there. But now, in typical, like um, in, in Cuba, I mean, they have Varroa, but the survival stock has kind of survived through it and gotten through it. I mean, even with our technology today, there's been a lot of controversy over should we have ever treated for Varroa 20 years ago. If we wouldn't have, we would have had that major drop, and now the survival stock that would have come back may have been stronger and not had to deal with the chemicals and everything. So have, we're not quite sure. Do they have a lot of Africanized I'm not sure. I have not found it yet at all. All the samples that I've brought back for Fabus testing that I've done have not shown African, but they are defensive. And they are almost like the German mellifera mellifera. So they are, can be that testy bee. So I'm not quite sure where that line is yet. I mean, it, Puerto Rico has an African bee, but they are very workable. They're, they're very tolerable, almost like they are here in South Florida. I mean, they're very easily, you know, they hybrided down or are they workable? Um, the diseases are that's kind of up in the air yet. I mean, they're they're they're, they're yeah. It's it's uh, every race of bees has a little bit different qualities. You know, you but at the same time, you might not get a honey production or a, an early startup or you know. So it's it's like it's it's one of one or one or the other. You, you got that. You only got so much genetics there that you got to tip the scale one way or another on those genes. Uh, this is another beekeeper that I was working with in the south, and he was. He had about 100 colonies going, and it was really fun to see that he started
in these, these long, kind of like a Tanzanian boxes when I first walked up and I couldn't quite figure out what, we, what he was doing. And he was basically mimicking his logs. So basically all the beekeepers that I work with across the board are working in, in logs and in a, in a bee gums. And he was just basically taking it and mimicking that and making these planks and making a, a similar kind of design. Uh, he had just started doing a, a few Langstroth and he was just excited as could be that he was started in Langstroth equipment. He was able to afford, um, this gentleman in particular, he had a, he'd made about a drum of honey and he was able to sell it in Port-au-Prince to a company that was making these little snack bars, almost like a little energy bar, and they would just mix it in with little nuts, and basically they were sesame, little sesame and honey bars. And he made so much money from this that he, the entire city now became bee-oriented. And there was like 50 people showed up, and they all he had 55 beekeepers that registered that they wanted to all do bees. So I could really see these little micro economies growing in certain little niche areas. And it was all due to this one guy. But basically, like I say, this log was about three feet in diameter, a big piece of slate, and this is a piece of tin. Bees, um, I've been real fascinated with, with how they actually orient in them. And I'm finding out it's about 50-50 as far as how they put the comb in. Um, some run lengthwise, others go horizontal. So you're never quite sure why or what, but it is about 50-50. They actually do have some studies on that. Um, this is, this is a, the best movable frame. This one is actually, they just kind of tied it together with some raffia, some uh, palm fronds. This particular beekeeper, I got him coming up here. Um, I, I've been working with this guy really over all the years. I keep going back to the same thing. And this, this, my program has worked real well over the years is because of repetition. And I just always keep trying to go back and work with the same beekeepers year after year. Every, I try to get them a year and a half to two years. Let them go out on the line, figure it out. I'll come back, see where you're at, and kind of help you to that next level. So with him, when I first started working with him, he had six logs. And then he started getting up to 25 logs. And then he got it up to around 50 logs. And at that point, then he was able to start making money off of it. He didn't have a smoker. They had no idea. They usually just use a a, a smudge pot of some sort and put some old termite wood in it. And that's a, the only thing they understand. They had no clues to why it worked. It was just something that they did tradition. So basically beekeeping has been done for hundreds of years and generations. It's kind of handed down, but they have no knowledge of why things do the things that they do. And the honey's real dark and black. Is it good? No. <laughs> it's horrible. The floral sources are all over the place. Um, since they don't have a lot of floral, it's a lot of mixed combination of things. Certain islands, you can really get it pinpointed into coconut, and you can really taste the coconut or the mango in it, especially like the, even the pollen. They'll actually collect pollen in some islands, and you can really taste that it's mango pollen or coconut pollen. I mean, it really is distinctive. Here, you're getting a little bit of anything and everything because they don't have a, a floral source in general. Um, a lot of Coralita. Maybe it's from the Coralita, um, Chain of Hearts. Uh, now, um, they get palmetto, but not a lot of it. But it mixes in because they don't harvest often enough. So by the time they get in there with their smoker, with that smoke, so you're getting a lot of soot and ash mixed in with it. Because they're basically just taking a machete, cutting that out, and crushing it. And the, the, they barely run it through a piece of cloth or anything. Can no, no, they just, basically honey is always sold in a, in a Ziploc baggie because jars and anything, anything else outside of a water bottle is way too valuable. You don't even find rum bottles in Haiti. I mean, that's just way too expensive of a commodity for them. So basically you see Ziploc baggies and that's how it's usually sold or some old juice container or some, some old plastic bottle. They don't know any different. I mean, it's, you got to remember, their, their, their mentality is, you'll, you'll, it's, it's still a sugar product. And it's sugar is a valuable commodity. And everybody wants sugar. And they want their local honey. Because it's, it's also medicinal at the same time. So I, I should have brought, brought some with me. I, I, you wouldn't have wanted to taste it. I mean, it's just, it's just this black. It's black. And, is the mic up? 
it, it's, it's just a real black honey. It's just, it's nasty. It's just something that you don't want to put in your mouth. But now Mr. this is Mr. Sonor, and Mr. Sonor now has, um, he's really got it up to around 75 of these logs, and he's starting to make money, and he started to go into college on it. So all of a sudden now with that 75 hives, he was actually able to afford a moped. He's able to go into the city and start college. So he's in an agronomy school. He got into his second year, he was a second year agronomy student. He's got it up to now, and uh, we started then with the program I started working with was I started we doing top bar hives. The logs are just not sustainable. I'm not going to discourage it because it's a traditional method of keeping bees. I don't discourage that at all, but I want to encourage getting into top bar just due to the fact that I know that beetles are in Dominican Republic. If they get into these hives, I can't imagine what they would do in a log. It's just a nightmare. And I want them to be able to start getting a little bit more production. So I came up with some, uh, some plywood boxes. You'll see some coming up here. And, we, and he actually started just doing a few little Langstroth boxes to experiment with, with his money. But he's um, really got a, a really good thing going. So he's become a model for this whole region up in the mountains. And up there, we, we use a, an old church, not an old church, a church. And it was, uh, it's really kind of fun to see all these little white dots all through the pictures. You know, are just the holes in the tin roofs because they, it's, it's beautiful. Um, but we, I always had to have, uh, so I had an agronomist come in also. So I have to have an interpreter, but then I always have to have an interpreter's interpreter because now we're into a pigeon language. That it's, so it's basically hillbilly creole. That, <laughs> and so I have to have somebody else explain, and my interpreter explains what I want. Now he's got to explain to the, to, to the local dialects. So it's a real long and laborious procedure that goes on. And we just draw on a chalkboard. Um, I had 40 people show up. They came for, for four days in a row. The longest one guy came in. I don't know if I got a photograph of him here. I, I don't. But we built these hives. I uh, was able to get some money from Rotary International. Gave me $1,000. And I was able to go down with that money and buy plywood. And plywood is $80 a sheet. So, 80 US a sheet for plywood. So with that, I was able, it was the only stable wood you can come up with because the planks of wood now that they have are all different dimensions. So you can't, and, and, and just as expensive or more expensive, so you can't come up with a dimensional wood outside of plywood. So we, by the time I spent, it was you know, then $100 to have somebody drive the truck up the mountain with the plywood on it, yada, yada. But I was able to take that, that plywood sheet and make some little small top bar hives. And we were able to get four of them out of a sheet. So now I've got my cost down to $25. So at least with one month's labor, they can actually afford with, you know, remember, it takes their entire wages for one month now to buy, a, a, to buy one box. But they're willing to do that. So we took our boxes and now we've got our sheets of plywood and we were able to take our 24 of them. And we actually co-opted it. And I took some smokers down with me. I went and um, I actually imported from China. I brought some smokers in and some, <laughs> some veils. And I actually, so I translated it. Actually, I took the, the, the blueprints and I was able to translate it all into Creole and then give everybody a sample. And we had to wait for a couple days because the one saw and the one hammer were tied up in somebody's house and he wasn't in town that day. So we had to wait for that, this old rusty saw. Now. This is three-quarter inch plywood. Can you imagine cutting this three-quarter plywood? So this was a, so I laid the thing all out, and, but everybody in that group that you saw around that table, everybody had to take the meter stick and remeasure. Nobody was allowed to cut till everybody in the group, everybody had to make sure that those measurements were exactly the way they wanted. So it took about three hours for them to, to cut those pieces out for one box. So it was a real labor intense. Um, I actually, I brought some um, window screen, some uh, gutter screen down with me too, a few pieces just for samples to show them what screening cloth or anything that they could come up with. And uh, some nails, because nails are just about as valuable of a commodity as anything else in Haiti. I mean, it's just a valuable, you find, you know, they pull out some little thing with three nails in it and it's, it's a big deal. Oh yeah, it's just, it's crazy to see. But they were just intent on it. So we built, we built these hot boxes, we talked about them, we put our screen on them, 
And then we just took one of those planks of wood that we we're talking about, and I found something that was around 32 to 35 millimeters, our typical B space. I found a plank that was about that thick, and we cut some strips, and then we cut the we took each one of them, we cut a groove down it. Actually, I even was able to find a little piece of cardboard, and we, we waxed them all in, and we put some little starters in them to get them going. And I took down some little veils. I took down 10 veils with me. Um, it was funny is I took 10 sets of gloves down also. I don't know if I've got a picture of this. And this is the log that we transferred over. Um, this, was, this guy didn't have a smoker at all or even a smudge pot, so they just roll up a banana leaf and blow on it, and that's kind of how they get there to, to turn their hives. So they handed, the, handed me this knife and said, okay, here you go. And <laughs> there isn't manuals on how do you get transferring you know, we're used to transferring stuff out of walls and things and seeing things normal, but sticking your arms in a log that you don't know who else is living in this log along with it is, is, is kind of a goofy scenario. But I was able to do it. We got it out. And then dropped to a trot bar hive. So as I pulled these chunks out, I, I, it was so big and so heavy, a lot of these things, I found some scrap fabric and I made some little hammocks out of it. And so we just, I just suspended them. I took my veil and I ripped some, some string off and started just kind of fudging it. I mean, there's, what else are you going to do? As you can see, so a lot of them are pretty much, they, they, um, they, they're in fear of bees, but not, you know, they, they've always been trained, like most of us, everybody to respect them. So they're not, not quite sure. They like the idea of working with bees. Can they, they see the the economy going and we can do this. Um, I really like working with a lot of, I try to encourage a lot of women and youth to come in. Um, the, the way the farms have been divided up in the land over the years is that they have farms, but they have farms in different locations. They may have three farms, but they're in different spots in the country. And then the male, the, the patriarch of the family, he goes and he may have a family in each one of these things. It's just acceptable that he has a family in you know, five hours this way, another 10 hours over there. And he just kind of rotates between farm to farm. And then he the, the, leaves the kids to take care of it. And then basically they're just kind of taking care of this little bit of a root crop that they can come up with. It's pretty much pigeon peas and, and carrots. And I mean, it's just, it's pretty, really pretty, pretty pathetic. Um, nice queen, Haitian queen. Haitian queen, so you see these big nice, so they do come in nice sizes. So here's the boxes that we built. So I actually make them go back on the back side, and they have to document everything for me and prove that what they've done over the years, that it's actually going, and they are doing what they're saying they're going to do. If they want me to follow up and come back, they have to follow up with a program. Um, I took my wife down there. This was my other interpreter that I had from Favica. So I took my wife down, and she did some candle making classes and teaching them how to dip candles. Um, same thing up behind the church, they would just kind of light a fire, a little charcoal fire. I mean, it's just, uh, it's crazy. The kids, there's no fear of fires and using big knives to open cans up and things. Uh, we, we did some sand casting also, took, showed them how to do sand casting candles. Um, took some little tins and that, but they didn't like to use the tins and little evaporated cans for, for candles, which would seem to me ideal, but they looked at it as being garbage. So they didn't like the idea about you recycling garbage. I know I talked to some other Peace Corps workers, and they would take newspapers and get those little things that roll newspapers up real tight to burn them as logs. Well, they looked at it as you're burning garbage. They didn't want to do something, and re recycling just doesn't enter their brains at all. So it was really hard to get across and not to get it around the charcoal or using the little the, the cans as a mold or or as a, as a final, you know, something to use for your candle. So you, you got a lot of problems that way. Um, I had worked with these young boys previously when they were about nine years old. And as I went back, they started building. So they started doing the hives. But they actually had even changed some of the designs that I had. So I just had a typical top bar hive that laid across, but now they had kind of made grooves inside and so that everything set flush. And they were starting to actually thinking, they'd seen our Langstroth equipment on, on our 3 8 inch, our 1 and 3 8 dimension with those little bars that we have. So now they decided to space them. Instead of leaving everything tight, 
like a top bar. So they're actually seeing things, but they're making mistakes at the same time. So you've got to go back in and try to correct them. And it's like now you've got too much of a space. You're getting two inches between frames as your, as your B space, opposed to that, that one and three A's. But, but at the same time, they're getting results. The, uh, I don't know where this kid came up with this winter jacket <laughs> at all. I mean, it was, it was just it was crazy. And I, I, like I said, I, but earlier I was saying I, I took some gloves down there, and the first time I passed gloves on, everybody put the gloves on upside down. And I, and I was just like, well, everybody, I kind of like went, something's wrong. Everybody's walking around with their hands. Like, and like, but then I realized they'd never seen gloves before. I mean, it was a new thing to them. Why would you ever have gloves in Haiti? No, no frost, no frost, nothing cold, no, no reason to put on a pair of gloves. The same thing years ago where I used to work for a sugar company, and they get these guys from Jamaica, and, and, and they expect you to learn them how to drive tractor. They never even seen one. No. Like an elephant. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. So it, it was encouraging to see these. Now, these kids, we would, we, about an hour and a half up the mountain, and then we'd have to walk about, after the four-wheel drive couldn't go, we'd have to walk another half hour to their house. So it's really, really remote locations and, and really tough they're getting results, right? yeah. but they're getting results and that's what they're really so encouraging to see this is you like this, this this was my this was my ode to, to I think they had seen Sam Comfort somehow this <laughs> this was a as you can see this is a kitchen chair yeah. this is a kitchen chair so they've taken a kitchen chair and just kind of stuck some bars in there and turned this kitchen chair into a hive. Hey, I like it. I mean, Sam would do that. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they really become, I've got, my background is in art, so I really like a lot of these objects. So they become these sculptures all the time. Every time I see one, I just get real excited about how they come up with these things and where they, I mean, it's just crazy, the designs. and. It's anything and everything that they can come up with. If they can put bees in it, they're trying. That's a coconut frond, right? Yeah, it's just a big palm, palm frond on top for a lid and a piece of cardboard and kind of strap it all together. They do have a lot of problems with ants. Ants and the frogs are, are, are a big issue down there. So we, we work on that kind of stuff. Um, up in the north, up in the uh, plateau, right after the earthquake happened, in the central plateau, just north of Port-au-Prince, is um, they consider the breadbasket. And they took a lot of the kids that were orphaned, and they just kind of ran them up there and dumped them. And there was a school up in that area, and it's affiliated with a, a university called Queenlands University. And they kind of dumped these kids. They gave them all a shovel and a pack of seeds and said, go. And it was just the most bizarre thing. No knowledge, nothing. Here's these kids from Port-au-Prince that know nothing about you know, agriculture I've ever seen land. They're used to the city, and now they're being tossed out into this rural agriculture. And so the, this, was a, this was a little bee school that had started up there in this city. And uh, you can see this, the little holes from the tin roof there. So this was what they had sent me. And so I kind of backed them, and I got involved with uh, FOA, which is out of Rome, it's the, the big World Food Organization, and then Appamundia, which is the World Bee Organization. And Appamundia and a group out of London, which is called Bees for Development, and I, we all work together and we raise funding for the school. And so we kind of backed it and they had to kind of document it, but I'm not sure the money ever went to the end result. So I've had to kind of break off. All of a sudden I found out they were buying concrete blocks and sand and things and so I wanted the money to go towards students to stay and keep them in school. I wanted each each student had to get so much scholarship like three hundred dollars and that would give them enough food and and living quarters for that year to go to B college and all of a sudden money was getting diverted so I, it, you got to really watch who you work with in these third world countries. That's what I was going to say. What happens with all the money that the United States sent over there? Over it's there? never been said whatever happened to it. <laughs> I mean even the, the it's, the schools are looking at this. Yeah, it, it's terrible, and you just don't. You're never quite. You're never quite sure where the money went. The whole Bush, uh, Clinton Bush Foundation that went down there, and Clinton found. You just can't get through to anybody to even find out where the funding is to get to that next level. So it's it's really frustrating to deal with. Um, 
it's really interesting too. You get into these schools. When I get the kids into the schools, you get a lot of them that are these uh, role of religious groups that are going down there. And almost everybody at the airport is affiliated with some church on some mission group, sometimes. But a lot of the kids that come into my classes, I'm getting these older students. I'm actually getting a lot of Jewish kids in there, which I found really fascinating because all of a sudden now I've got this group of 40 people. I've got 10 of them that are wearing are going to Jewish school and you're kind of like, how is this just, none of it makes, I mean, you get the Baptists and you get the born agains and you get the Jehovah's and you get a few Christians and, you know, heavily Baptist, but now you're getting a lot of Jewish kids. And so I can't quite put a finger on it and I, and I don't go there. I don't care as long as they're coming to learn about beasts. That's my main objective. So I don't judge any of them um, across the board. Um, people, a lot of people ask me how I, my accommodations in that. This was a kitchen that I, this was a, the major kitchen for, that we worked out of. Yeah, we had, this was a, this was a big deal kitchen because we actually had two stove, they had two stoves, they had one on each side here. It was a, it was a, it, I mean, it's just basically some rocks and that's it. Yep, some plantains and some bread, some breadfruit. Uh, where's it all going to go? I mean, it's just, uh, what's the future? I think, you know, education and support and just keep going doing future missions into the groups. It all ends up being a sustainable income for them long term. If they can get a little bit of money, uh, of that money that they make every month, they really like to put their kids in private schools, which is the, the strangest thing. The public schools are just about as good, but they really prefer the, the, the church schools that are there. So they'll take a third, if not three quarters of their income every month and put it toward kids because they know that education is the only way out of this situation that they're in. They're not stupid people. They're super cleanly. I mean, it's shocking for the conditions that they're in, how clean they actually are. Um, and we all, all we can hope for is that it's going to fight poverty and hunger for that next generation. So if we can get some kind of food and some protein into these kids, that'll get their brains going, that they'll start clicking and they'll get out of this scenario and have a, a, a long-term outlook on it. And part of that whole thing is what I've done is I've actually come up with a little guidebook. So I, and being part of B College and being the master program, big prom promoter of it, is part of my master, I'm going for, well, I'm kind of being thrown into it, is, <laughs> is master, I know that. <laughs> is, is, and working with the B College down there, starting the B College, and it actually start, goes back a few years prior to that even with Jerry Hayes. I traveled with him through the islands and telling me that I needed to come up with a little manual or something. And it really came out of the Haiti. I started doing something, and I really wanted it. I've got it down to 32 pages of just simple, simple, basic information so that when somebody asked me something, they could go back and... I'm having it translated into Creole right now. <laughs> So um, University of Florida, I've got the Creole Society. It's just about got it finished for me. That'll hopefully will be this fall. I'm trying to put off this next trip down there till I can get them printed in, in Haitian. Not that it's going to help a lot. Um, I've had some manuals in French. It just really never works. I mean, there's just enough of a break in the language that they just can't quite get it, especially when they get into the pidgin language. In, in the outer edges. So I've kind of got it, it's bigger than I wanted it to be. I wanted something that I could give out and pass out. So when I go down to these areas, everybody gets something in their hand. So there's no excuse that they can't remember what B space is or what, what's going on in a colony. So that's where I've been, that's been my project. And this will be for my master craftsman level, which I've been thrown into by Jamie and the crew. I mean, it's always, it's always one more hook on it, you know. Now I have to go down and prove myself and prove it and go down and, and, and use the manual in, in place down there, which isn't a problem because I, I enjoy going down and do the training anyway. Um, and that's me. You ready for our trip to Cuba? I'm ready for Cuba. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, love to, I'd love to go down to Cuba. I need to hit Cuba next. I'd love to go down, yeah. Yes, ma'am. All the time. Because they want Kenya to be an ally of the United States, but there's no follow-up. So they pour a lot of money into the country. Nobody um, knows where it goes because there's no supervision. No yeah, I, where the money's going to go. 
I, I hate to say it even this, right now I'm, the group that has asked me to go down there is, is Partners in America, which is part of USAID, Partners in America, Farmer to Farmer, is how the, the money goes. And they will only send me for two weeks minimum. They want you to go for three weeks. I'm going, I can't go talk to 10 people for two weeks about beekeeping. I don't need that much time. I need a week. Give me a week, give me five days, and I can explain it all and get in and get out. I'd rather have it divided into six months from now or a year from now, go back to that same group and repeat and repeat and repeat. Not to have two weeks of sitting there going, now Now, what are we gonna talk about? We've talked about everything in the, I can go through the manual and go through the practicals, but if they don't have bees. Somebody in the state uh, um, sits there and writes these regulations, but they don't ask the people in no. How do you want that money? So I'm trying to, I said I would go down if I could actually see the, my other group. If I could work with my other group, I'll go deal with this group in, in Port-au-Prince in this, it's the most dangerous, <laughs> poorest dangerous city in Port-au-Prince. And that's where they want me to go and work. I'm, I'm more than willing to go in and help the people. I have no problem. But I also want to go in and visit these people to see how they're doing and what's going on there and what they need to get to that next level. Can I aid them? Questions? Beekeeping questions. Come on, any of you. Come on. They're pretty, they're pretty good to work with. I mean, they're a little bit, they can be a little testy at times, but um, kind of that like mellifera mellifera, you know, like your black bees. Um, I'm not sure though, like I say, if, if they are actually some of the Iberican. Did they bring back samples? I, I did. I did. I usually I, I've been sending this. Like I said earlier, I guess you didn't hear me when I first came in. Um, I sent him to Dijon down in Brazil. I sent wings and legs down to him. Yeah. I usually just snip off the wings and dehydrate or the le rear legs and then de dehydrate them a little bit. And are they working with any of the stingless bees over there? No, they don't have any that I have ever come across. Not there? Okay. I, I have Costa never. Rica yeah, Costa Rica and uh, Tobago has them. Trinidad. They may be some in Trinidad, but they don't work them at all. They're, it's all Afri Trinidad's all African. Uh, Tobago is 20 miles away, and it's European bees, but they have the stingless bees there, the, yeah. the meliponas. You said that they're using the honey as a medicinal. What sorts of things do they treat with it? Um, any, a lot of times the wounds in that, they'll use it for wound care a lot. And there's even some of the tr uh, traditions that you mix a little bit of ginseng in with it or, or cinnamon. In with it, it's like a spoonful of it every day. And they'll eat it, and it's just part of that. The, there's, um, I don't know what you'd say. It's it good for? Anti like an anti-inflammatory. It's an anti-inflammatory. The the room, the cinnamon and, and the honey at the same time. And, and they'll, they, if they can get ginseng, they'll mix in that also. How do you make increase? I mean, is there any queen rearing? I mean, no, there's no queen rearing. How in the world do you get them? There's wild bees everywhere. I mean, there's wild bees in all these cliffs and that. There's so many rocky outcrops of that limestone throughout the islands that you can these you can find them. Yeah, they'll, they'll find these logs and they'll actually put them in the log and they don't let them out for three days. They'll pick those palm fr <laughs> palm fronds on a log. They'll find that swarm, put them in there, trap them for three to four days, and then when they so let they when they open it, don't no, they don't have no clue. That's the one, the one wild hive I did find out in a little tree, the kids, it was a big problem with the kids. The kids were actually, we were trying to get the bees out and the kids were trying to get the, 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 all the, uh, the brood to eat. So we actually had one guy grabs a stick and he's beating these kids because the kids were trying to, the kids are so anemic that they want the protein, so they're just grabbing egg. I'm thinking they're grabbing honey and it's like they had no interest in the honey. They wanted the eggs. Do you find any colony collapse down there? No. Even here in Florida now, we haven't seen colony collapse for three years. So we don't really... Yeah, it's gonna be, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be interesting with this whole Zika thing. It, it, this whole Zika thing is a, it's a really bizarre. I was actually diagnosed with it last February. I'm in St. Augustine and was, was medically diagnosed with it. When you went to the islands, did you have to get any shots for like malaria or anything like that? No, no. I usually get a, I have hepatitis. I've done some of that stuff prior. I had, I had to get yellow fever malaria shots when I went to Trinidad to Tobago Barbados. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, it's... I was diagnosed with it not, not being in the islands. 
So it was a, it was a really, it's, it's a really bizarre how this whole Zika scare has been going and they're not really talking about it. They don't even tell you what the outcomes are long term. They have no idea. But they would never say it publicly that I had it because they can't, die, they can't test for a male. The, it's an interglobulin M test blood that only works on females. So they don't, there's a male can't be tested for it. So they just said, no. Can now as a male be tested for it and stuff? Probably not. We have, but you can be now because now we can detect how long it takes for the antibodies right, to, to right. work on you now. So that I mean, it's just it's it's really a strange thing how they're what what. what the problem is from, Say your prayers. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it's no, it's not. It's just a bad. It's bad flu. It's it's basically I had conjunctivitis in the eye and then it went into like flu-like symptoms and then a rash from ankles to the neck. I mean, complete hives type thing, and just joint aches and pains, fever up and down. So it was just like an uncontrolled thing, and a week later, you're fine. I mean, it was just like kind of having a weird flu with a rash. No, no, I wasn't pregnant. <laughs> or gay. <laughs> Yeah, they should. They It's real. Hey, hang on. Hong has some very strict regulations on spraying in part due to this organization, and they have already sprayed through most of this area. They have to spray at night. But the mosquitoes not out. Yes, they've done it. They've already done it. They've done it. It's, it. it's already happened. They may do another round, but they've already done a couple rounds so far. I'm talking about one again. Yes. They've already sprayed in that area. Anything west of military, they, north of Louisiana, north of Louisiana, they're, they're doing stuff in Boynton also, west of 4.1. They don't have any future plans. As of yesterday, when I called the hotline, they have no future plans for spraying. I'll share the phone number that I called with the SOZ. The mosquito hotline. There is an actual mosquito hotline that you can call and find out what they're doing. And they have reported that will tell you updates. I'll, I'll share that yeah. About the only thing you can do to protect a hive, if you have a few hives, is to put a bed sheet over it, and take some old sheets, and just throw it over the front entrance. Basically what the spray does, it's gonna kill any bees that are gonna be out on your front entrance, on your landing board. Those are the ones that are the most acceptable. The, 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 the chemical's not gonna go inside, and it dissipates with sunlight. It's usually gone. If she absconded, yeah. She if she absconded, she's probably out in the wild, and it, hopefully she's underneath something. Just a big board or something over that entr that entrance that entrance board, your landing board. That's the ones that are going to be the most acceptable. It comes down. It's going to settle down. It's not going to go on the high. But it's basically that front entrance that that's just that's going to be the most acceptable. Not for the night. <laughs> yeah, it's just. <laughs> of what? Is any of your training involved pest identification? Uh, yes, I do some pest and pest and uh, disease management. I usually teach a class on that when I go into the islands. Um, I usually talk to my host countries when I, before I go in and find out what their needs are. Instead of being, um, the, the Caribbean is real interesting because it's so complex as far as their history is gone. Because so many islands are, are still British ruled, but at the same time they may be, Trinidad and Tobago for example, you've got two different countries, 
two different constitutions under one republic, but it's still under the crown. So try to get something done. You know, so it's like, uh, who do I go to? And every, there's, you know, three quarters of the people there work for the government in some capacity. So you almost have to, and they're so used to the British coming in there and saying, now this is what you're going to learn today. And I go in and say, what do you want to learn? I'll teach you what you want. You want beginners? You want disease? Do you want to learn how to trap bees at the port? What do you need to do? So I always try to give them the options that we can work through things. Um, I never try to tell them what to do. So I've got a list of about 20 different topics that I can go through and talk about. Stingless bees, I've got a little presentation on that, or Hopkins queen rearing, um, teaching that, or just general queen rearing and grafting. I mean, there's some different techniques that you can do for things, and it's like I always try to look for alternatives to what they're normally going to be hearing somebody else come in and tell them what to do. Yes, ma'am. Any question? Yep. So they're almost like a closed herd that's on the island, so they don't have to deal with as much disease issues? They, uh, they have disease and problems, too, because the stuff's coming in on the, on the ships, on the ports. The ports are just a major problem on all these islands because it's... They're running up from the, you know, South America, and they're just running up to Miami. And so these bees are coming off and jumping on oh. off these ports. You always find them on container ships uh, oh. these are, or wild swarms. So some islands are really good about you know, monitoring them. Other islands are clueless. They just don't care. I mean, I usually try to get to the agriculture, Minister of Agriculture, I usually try to have meetings with them to at least try to say, look, you know, you're getting your honey production up. People want local honey. You're not going to have to import it. Wouldn't you rather have beekeepers on the island and bring your own honey production up where you're eating local and eating your own and having, you know, jobs created? Or do you want to import stuff from China at a higher price? Sometimes it is. Um, if, if, if well, if we can get into the top bar hives now, we're cutting off and we're we're teaching them. You know, how do you exactly or using it for your own because they don't have electricity. Um, Haiti has about twenty five percent of the people in Haiti have electricity. Fifteen percent pay for it. So it's just like and, it, and even in Port-au-Prince, it's a rolling cycle. You never know when you're going to have a blackout. Most of the city blacks out a lot during the night. And everybody pours on the street. The streets are mobbed at night. You can't figure out why. It's, it's pitch blackout. And then you realize that the buildings are, it's a blackout, so everybody comes out on the streets to rely on the car headlights to hang out with their friends. All the buildings that are sent there and nothing's going on. No, it's the infrastructure, and there were so many different countries involved in the infrastructure. I think it got, because, so you know, the Chinese were going to put in the sewer systems, and the Mexicans were going to put in the roads, and then this country, Netherlands, was going to, you know, put in the street lights. You just, like, going in and come. And it, and it all just gets, you know, dwindled away and who gets it except some government officials. So it's just, it's really a sad scenario across the board. I mean, I, I heard that a lot of the money had never been spent, that it was just sitting in, in some idle, but I don't know that. There's $3 billion sitting idle because uh, we told them, you get the $3 billion when you have a building code. And they keep saying, well, give us the money now, we'll get the building code later. Right. And, they're not giving them the money unless they get a building code. It's, it's, it's a disaster. I mean, because it, it's anything goes. I mean, it's, it's, um, the, the garbage and the rubble on one side, you see all the garbage is piled up on one side of the street, but now on the other side is where they took all the building material. It's, all the, it's one side is like lined with bricks and there's rubble from the buildings, and the other side is all the garbage. I mean, the last time I was there, they hadn't had garbage pickup in three years. So now you've got all these water lines that are broken from the earthquake running through all that garbage. So it's nothing but gray water, and that's where they wash and they do their, you, you I mean, I've got photographs of kids in this, in the gutters cleaning themselves, and you're just kind of going like, they may be washing a motorcycle right next to the kid that's being washed for his night bed. I mean, it's just, it's, it's insanity. You don't find as much begging as, as I would expect. You know, you find almost more begging in Miami. Well, it's <laughs> Miami. It's, I just don't see it in in Haiti. I think they're so poor that they don't beg. You'll see some people, you know, with since the earthquake, you'll see guys without their limbs or something out begging. But that's about it. I mean, you really don't see people out on the street. I've never had anybody ask me for money down there ever. Even now, these people, they've never asked me for a dollar. They're they're too proud. You mentioned uh, doing some uh, uh, 
work out there with the Peace Corps also, or some encounters that you had out there with the Peace Corps to help you with this? How was working with the Peace Corps? Um, Peace Corps is kind of, it's, um, I've, the, this last interpreter I had was a Peace Corps guy. Uh, they're kind of all over the place too. I mean, it's, it depends on where they're trained. And a lot of the Peace Corps guys have been trained in Africa. They, lo they love sending them to Uganda. And um, I actually have a friend now, she's in uh, Liberia right now. So it's just like, it's really bizarre. And then they come back and then they want to teach African beekeeping. You know, yeah, it's, it's, you're in the Caribbean. I mean, it's just, so it's like, yeah, it's, there's a lot of crossovers. There's, there's so much of it's crossover, but at the same time, no, there's not. It's like, it's like, it's a different animal. Well, it's it's a different. Southern beekeeping in the United States. Exactly. I mean, yeah, well, it's a, Try to convince somebody not to use an inner cover in South Florida. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's just, it's funny. What, what's next on your travel? Um, they've asked me to go to Haiti here, you know, this fall in Barbados. So, uh, so uh, yeah, I've been down to Barbados quite a few times. And we've got um, a guy over in Gainesville right now is David Small. He's the president of Barbados Association. He's been learning USDA testing. I mean, it, it's funny, as USDA, there's only a, like four or five people in the entire country that know test, how to test for USDA bees. I mean, it was, uh, David Barnes was the only one, and then he trained, Westerville got trained, and I mean, there's only a handful of people. It's really funny. So David's learning how to do that. He's getting his last certification up here now to be able to go down to the Caribbean, and in the Caribbean in Grenada, we actually started a, the Eastern Caribbean Research Lab down on the island of Grenada at uh, St. George University there. So we've kind of tied it all in together. And we'll do, we're actually going to do the, the next Caribbean Bee College is going to be next year. We're talking May, we'll be in Barbados. So that's in the works right now. We haven't got a location yet, but that looks like it's going to happen. Yes, ma'am. Um, not at the moment. I've been, what I've been doing is selling the t-shirts and my main little manual here, and that money just goes back into the, the more stuff, and then I can take the manuals down and pass the stuff off, or it kind of goes back into the project is how I've been doing it. So I've been real fortunate with that. A five dollars. Well, I would take donations, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how. Gee, I've never... Gee, I've never had that happen. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I don't. I, sure, sure, we can work that through. We can work. We can work. If I can interject here, Palm Beach County Beekeepers Association is giving a check to Bo for five hundred dollars.